I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. Today, a sneak peek at the newest Glidewell publication. Megan dresses like a Dalmatian and a tongue device to prevent tartar formation and possibly tenderized beef. That and more on today's Terracide Live. Hello and welcome to episode 44 of Chairside Live. Megan, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, but I'm recovering from a pretty nasty spill Ooh. that I took mountain bike riding. Yeah, so please excuse the bandages, but uh, yeah, I was riding with my husband and I hit a patch of sand and off I flew. Wow, that's, um, you, you didn't have elbow pads on? Of course not. Oh, helmet? Uh, always. Okay, just checking. All yeah. right. Okay, good. So it looks like uh, it's bandaged, no stitches or anything no like that? No stitches, but it was not pretty. I'm hoping, were you riding with your husband? Uh, yes, I was. Was he wearing a GoPro? Is there footage of this? I, w I wish he has a GoPro. I actually got him the latest edition. That's right, for Christmas? For Christmas, That's yes. Right. And so, but he So he really loves it. He, <laughs> <laughs> he uses it all the time, but for... on this particular day, mm -hmm. he didn't use it. Okay. And I'm so bummed because that was my first question. Wait, did you get that? Um, but yeah, no, but he was there to witness it. Wow, well, glad to see that uh, you've recovered. Yes. Somewhat. You I'm... can type. Yes, you it kind of hurts to put my elbow down, but I think I'll live. All right, very good. Well, you look a little like Brady, Betty Draper today. I know that's a reference that might be lost on you, but uh, it's a compliment. Thanks. I appreciate You're that. You're very welcome. Um, before we get going today, we're going to do a little segment that we like to call Shameless Promotion. As you know, we usually don't do that much shameless uh, promotion on the show, but I did want to bring one thing to your attention, and that is the new Glidewell catalog that's uh, going to be arriving in your mailboxes soon, probably in the next week or two. Uh, some of you may already have it. Uh, the first thing you'll notice, the first uh, glaring omission, is that Megan and I are not on the cover. Right, what I don't a bummer. Know how, I don't know how that happened. Uh, maybe next year, we'll, we'll hold out hope for, for 2014 maybe, uh, that we'll be able to get on the cover. But it's a really remarkable uh, book. It's 120 pages uh, of what we do here. And it not only goes into detail about the products, uh, but it actually shows uh, some of my cases, some of the techniques. It shows the reverse prep uh, kit. It shows different digital impression things. I mean, it really is good reading. So I know you might see this and it comes in the mail and your first instinct is just take it and toss it in the trash. Uh, but there's some good stuff in here. I'm really proud of the effort that the marketing team here put together. It's fabulous. It's free. Uh, just take a look and go through and you'll see some neat stuff there uh, before you put it in your uh, restroom or before you chuck it. There's really some good stuff besides detailing all the products we have. Uh, hopefully you'll learn some good uh, clinical uh, tips and techniques. So thank you for that and thank you for giving us a little time to talk about that. And our case of the week this week is actually something that I saw while walking through the implant department this week. And it was something that I hadn't seen before, so I wanted to share it with you. It was a dentist who used some closed tray transfer coping, some closed tray impression copings, and then used an open tray technique to actually take the impression. Let's go ahead and take a look at that case now. I was walking through the implant department the other day and I, I saw something that I haven't seen too many times before, but the technicians at the implant uh, department told me that it's, it definitely happens uh, maybe once a month as frequently as that. And, and that is a dentist using a, a closed tray uh, transfer coping with an open tray impression technique and that never works really well. And I'll, I'll, we'll go over a couple things here so you kind of understand that. I just snapped some pictures of this case because they couldn't be without it. So um, you're probably familiar with this. This is a transfer coping or some people call it an impression coping. Uh, this is for the closed tray system. And so this will be inserted uh, onto the implant and then you'll screw this screw down here and it'll engage into the implant and pull itself down and boom, be down all the way. And you'll notice that you won't see any space here when this is all the way down. And uh, many dentists will shoot a picture real quick just to make sure it's all the way down, shoot an x-ray before they take the impression. And you can see by the shape of this that there's, there's no undercuts here. Uh, this is made to have an impression tray and impression material slid down on top of it. It's going to set for four to five minutes and then we're going to take the impression out and then we'll unscrew this and either the doctor or the lab will reseat this uh, transfer coping into the impression, put the analog on, pour it up, and then start to fabricate um, whatever, a custom abutment or the crown that's, that's going to go on there. So this is our typical closed tray um, transfer coping. And uh, if we look next at an open tray 
transfer coping. You'll notice that it looks a lot different than the closed tray one does. Of course, we got this long back end of the screw sticking out here, and that's because it's going to go through an impression tray and be on the outside. So, of course, with the open tray technique, this is going to be screwed uh, into the implant, and then we're going to take an impression over this, where the impression tray ends up being right about this level right here. And then after the impression set, we're going to unscrew this and take it out and the transfer coping is going to stay inside the impression and that's because of this massive undercut that we have all around here. And so it's designed with this undercut to stay in the impression. Because of the fact that the transfer coping stays in the impression, uh, this is a more accurate way uh, to take implant impressions. Of course, uh, it's more work at the same time. It's a lot easier uh, to put the closed tray one on and just take a normal impression, take it out, and then send this back. But there's an, always a chance that this won't quite seat exactly the same way or it'll rotate slightly inside the impression. So while easier to execute, the closed impression is, it's just got a little more chance of something going a little bit wrong. Whereas with the open tray, um, this never leaves the impression material once the impression material has set and so even though it's a more difficult one to take and you need a special tray with a hole in it to be able to do it and then unscrew it while it's in the patient's mouth, um, this is the one that we've definitely found to be more accurate. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, what this case was, was a dentist using one of these, a closed uh, technique, a closed impression tray technique, a transfer coping uh, in an open tray technique. So let's, let's take a look at what that looks like. So again, here's Here's our um, uh, impression coping, and again, it's for a closed tray, and we've got an open tray here. You can see where it's, we've got this hole in the impression. You can see through all the way uh, to the black background. Uh, so that was used in this case, and, and when it sat back into the impression, the first thing we notice is there's a huge void uh, of impression material here. Uh, that's problematic, but even if that was there, um, again, we don't, we're really not able to engage. We don't have any undercuts to be able to engage this um, inside of there if we're going to try to remove this impression uh, with this in place. So you can imagine the forces of trying to unseat this polyvinyl impression and without having any undercuts on that transfer coping, you know, there's a good chance that when we pull that impression out, it's going to want to slip right off of here and then it's, it makes it a little more difficult uh, to reseat. In fact, if you look at this impression again, you can see uh, the hole that was there. And, and part of the issue here is because we don't have those undercuts, we lose uh, vertical control uh, of the transfer coping when it's done with an open tray technique like this. We need a vertical stop if we're gonna use this closed technique. We need to have impression material or the tray or something uh, to orient this so that when we push it into place, we know where to stop. When it's got this open end, this open uh, tray approach with a closed tray uh, impression coping, it's just going to keep sliding through that hole. There's the possibility that it continues to slide. And so here it is poking out when it came to us um, from the doctor. And when we go to put this in, we're not going to be able to control where it goes. There's just not enough retentive features on these closed tray impression copings to keep them uh, in place. And you can see here, as we section um, an impression that's taken around one of these uh, closed trays, that how we might be able to lose, uh, because we don't have the undercut so we can lose a reference point. This was an interesting one where the dentist actually uh, used the wrong screw here in, in this transfer coping. And so when it came to us, you could tell that it was, it seemed, it was screwed down all the way into the implant, uh, but it wasn't all the way down seated against the top of the transfer coping. And you can see that one of the possible positions is there's an opening right along here, but this uh, transfer coping would literally slip back and forth where it would slide all the way up and then could slide all the way down. And you were never quite sure where it was while the impression was being taken. And so that's an issue uh, as well if you choose a screw that's the wrong size. And uh, what that leads to is we poured it up both ways. We, we poured it up when it was down all the way here and up all the way here because it could be at either of those points or any point in between. And you'll see the difference when it's poured up, you know, when it's at its highest point and when it's at its lowest point. The difference is, you know, you can see most of the implant here and here you can see it's buried 
uh, you know, about two millimeters subgingival. And, and this is again the same case, just with the lack of vertical control on that transfer coping. And as a result, you know, this might be the one that fits and this one might be, you know, two millimeters out of occlusion and not even close, or this might be the right one. And this now we have an implant crown that's three millimeters high and we probably can't even get the abutment in place and have uh, the patient closed down. So um, really the take home message, I guess, from all this is it's probably not a mistake uh, you would make unless you're an implant beginner like I am. You know, if you saw our video, my first implant that was literally doing my first implant about two years ago and I've done a few since. Uh, but I have a lot of friends who are implant veterans and of course would never make an error like this. But honestly, this is something I could see myself doing is being told, hey, let's do an open tray on this, on this case. And I go, okay, sounds great. And I just reach and grab the same uh, impression coping that I've always used, which happens to be for the closed technique, even though I'm using an open technique. And even if I'm able to get access to this to unscrew it, um, the lack of retentive features here, the lack of undercut, uh, there's a pretty good chance this is gonna come out and we'll lose vertical control and the lab might overseat this into the polyvinyl siloxane impression and then everything's all screwed up. So I guess the take home lesson is just for the, the newer guys, newer to implants, uh, to restoring them anyway, that there is a difference between the open tray and the closed tray uh, impression coping. So you wanna make sure you use the right one or we're probably gonna have to start this case uh, over from scratch again. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Well, speaking of thank yous, ask and thou shall receive. Check this out. Wow. Look at that. That is incredible. I asked for this, what, four minutes ago, five yeah. minutes ago? I mean, we really have a stellar marketing department. The turnaround time is next to nothing. And it's already done. I love it. So we're stars. That's right. perfect. My first magazine cover. Thank you very much. <laughs> now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week we have two pieces of viewer mail for you, Dr. D, and the first one says, Dear Dr. Detola, any ideas why a patient after crown cementation would report pain when chewing hard foods like nuts or steak? I have ground crowns out of occlusion, some teeth have had endo, and no difference if it is a PFM or Bruxer. One patient had this type of pain before a crown prep on a tooth we did not suspect otherwise needed endo. Then I let him try it out for several weeks with only a temporary crown and the pain continued. We did endo and the tooth was fine. I completed the crown and now six months later on recall, the patient reports, Doc, this tooth still hurts when I eat nuts. Any thoughts? Thank you, Dr. Ron Berger. Well, Ron, that is a vexing problem, one that we hate. And I, I think it all comes down to what, you know, I've always heard referred to as, uh, as cracked tooth syndrome. And um, even uh, a tooth that has been treated endodontically, even though that will do the trick for, you know, 90, 95% of them, my understanding is if the fracture in the tooth is actually below the level of the crown or maybe below the level of the bone even, uh, even with endodontic treatment, when the patient bites down on that tooth on something hard, as you mentioned, you know, you mentioned nuts. The other ones that I always think of are uh, seeds and jams, like little indivisible units that won't break down any farther. When the patient bites down on that, um, and they squeeze on that tooth because of that seed and it flexes the tooth, even if the pulp is not in there anymore to experience that. If it is in fact a root fracture below the level of the bone, that's going to tug at the PDL. And when that periodontal ligament gets stretched, they're definitely gonna feel some pain there. Now, if the, the cracked part of the tooth was just in the coronal portion, you can imagine the crown holding it together and binding that together in most of those cases. If it's still sensitive, typically doing a root canal uh, therapy treatment and getting the pulp chamber and everything out of there uh, will make it better with the crown sitting on there. But I think if it's even apical to that, now you've got that PDL kind of being stretched at the same time. My dad was a dentist for 25 years and uh, we practiced together for a couple of years. And while we were practicing together, he had a cracked tooth, but he couldn't identify which one. And I'd get out the tooth sleuth and I'd have him bite on cotton rolls and we'd do all kinds of things. And then every once in a while, um, he'd be eating and all of a sudden he'd feel it and then we wouldn't be able to identify it. So one day we were having lunch together and he was chewing something, I don't even remember what it was, and all of a sudden he felt it. So we tore up the napkin and we made little, like, little napkin balls right there at the table and we're sticking it in. Other tables are watching us thinking we're insane. And he's biting down, he, ah, he finally found it. And that was it, it was tooth number 19. That was the one time we got to look at which tooth that was. And when I went in to prep it, and this was a virgin tooth, 
Um, and he said, go ahead and do it. It was really scary to do because I thought, what if we have the, the wrong two? So we broke the contacts. As I started doing the occlusal reduction, all of a sudden the distolingual cusp flew off. And for the first time, we could see uh, the fracture. So it's a, an elusive thing to diagnose sometimes and to treat. Uh, but I remember hearing from Gordon Christensen a long time ago, let the patient know you've got a, what we think is a cracked tooth. Putting a crown on it works about 90% of the time. Uh, there, that other 10% of the time may need to have a root canal as well to get it so it'll be asymptomatic. And then 1% of the time, both of those won't work because it turns out to be a root fracture. And really in cases like that, your only choices are uh, to put up with it or have the tooth removed and have an implant placed or a three unit bridge. So thank you so much for that question, appreciate that. Yeah, and our next question comes to us from Dr. Randy Farmer from Houston, Texas. And he writes, hi, Dr. Detola. I am in need of help with post-op sensitivity after crown preps. Do you recommend any type of cement or gluma or bonding agent that could help with this? I have tried using bonding liquid after the prep and that seems to have resolved it. However, it's just so expensive to use on everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It can be expensive on everybody. I do use it on everybody, but there are some value brands out there that I like. So really, you mentioned Gluma, and that's a great example. And basically, all of these uh, desensitizers are the same. They're 35% HEMA, 5% glutaraldehyde. Sometimes they throw in some extra things, but that's essentially what most of these are. And Gluma is by far uh, the most expensive. It was the first one on the market, and it's never really come down much in price. The two affordable ones that I like are Micro Prime from Danville Engineering and G5 from Clinician's Choice. Both of these are the same thing, 35% HEMA, 5% glutaraldehyde. Uh, Rella Christensen up at Track Research at CR has shown that if you uh, put a coat of this onto the tooth for one minute and then you air evaporate it and then put a second one minute coat on and air evaporate it again, when they do their testing in uh, the track laboratories, that kills 99% of the bacteria living on the tooth. Right, so nothing can survive that. Now it's difficult to have the patients to put two one minute coats on there. But to me as a general dentist, the biggest nightmare and the thing that I lose uh, more stomach lining over than anything is post-operative sensitivity. So I've gone one step farther and I feel like I can afford it because I'm using some of those more affordable desensitizer solutions. Before my assistant puts the temporary on, she puts one layer on for a minute. I'm out of the room, so this is no time off my back. Then she air evaporates it, puts a second one minute coat on, and then puts the temporary crown on. And that might be enough. That certainly seems to stop sensitivity that we used to have with the temporaries on. But just to be double safe, I'm actually doing those same two coats before we cement the permanent crown on two weeks later. And by the way, Gordon Christensen's research there at CR has shown that these desensitizers actually slightly increase the bond strength when you're using resin modified uh, glass ionomer cements to put the restorations into place. And we like resin modified glass ionomers uh, like 3MSB's Reliax Looting Plus or GC's Fujisem because of the low rate of post-operative sensitivity. So thank you for that. That's a real common concern that we hear from dentists and there's nothing worse, I think, than having a patient come in with an asymptomatic tooth. We tell them you should really have a crown here. They have it done and now they're in pain. They just can't help but look at us and go, this is your fault. And in a sense it might be, but that's why I love those desensitizers to stay away from that. So great question, I appreciate that. Two letters, what are we right. gonna do? Are we gonna have these guys arm wrestle for uh, letter of the week? No, or we, we wouldn't do that. Of course, each one of them gets their own frameable picture of you and I. Wow, they've tied for first place. All right, yes. if you're gonna do that, I'm gonna step it up and I'm gonna give away your iPhone to what? one of the, no, okay, I won't. I'm gonna give away uh, reverse prep kits okay. uh, to both the doctors. So they'll have the opportunity to look, read the directions. Mm -hmm. Actually, again, that technique is in the catalog if you happen to look at there. Sure. Um, I've said it a bunch of times before, um, my hands, I know they look super skilled. They look right. uh, like they might be registered weapons uh, uh -huh. with the local authorities. Uh, but in reality, they're very average. And uh, I actually came up with this technique so I could get good results with a so-so set of hands. So I'm not saying either of you have a so-so set of hands. I'm just saying that uh, whenever I've shown a dentist how to do this technique, they go, oh, that's cool. I hadn't seen that, I hadn't, seen that. I hadn't thought of it. That's a neat way to be able to do that. So nice. very nice. Glad yes. we're able to get those out to those dentists. Any news for us today, Megan? Yes. Are you looking for a new way to brush your teeth? Two Canadians have invented a new concept toothbrush called Tongue to Teeth. It is a disposable sheath that fits over the tongue and allows you to brush your teeth by licking them. The brush is covered in rivets and dimples to remove plaque and food from your teeth. 
the inventors are auditioning for the Canadian reality show Dragon's Den to pitch their idea in hopes of raising $100,000 to turn the product into a commercially viable idea. They also have officially applied for their Canadian patent. Wow, well, it's an interesting concept and sure. uh, I want to show everybody a picture of what this looks like. It's, um, <laughs> right. what does that look like to you? I don't, the first thing that comes to my mind is like a shark, but like one of those funny shark things right. that you put, like a, almost like a, have you seen those boogie boards? I don't know, in here in California, boogie boarding, I guess, that's not, the, but some people call it sponging, mm -hmm. but boogie boarding, they have one with, they have the shark, like little fin on the right. back as like a little joke. That's what it reminds me of. It's just it, ridiculous. It reminds me of um, something you might see on Game of Thrones, that old <laughs> uh, torture device with the uh, handle and then the chain links and sure. the ball with the spikes yes. on the end. That looks just positively medieval. Right. And, I, and I, it's interesting to me because why I'm, I, th I feel like the toothbrush is a perfectly capable tool. Right. Why are we trying? And it's not like it takes that much effort. I don't understand the need for something easier. Like you just put it on. Oh, hold on real quick. I'm going to brush my teeth and start licking around. It just seems it, like it would be easier just to grab your toothbrush and brush your teeth. Like are, a And aren't person. people's tongues going to get tired? Right. From having to, I mean, the tongue is not a muscle that we work to do. You never see people in the gym like lifting, you know, tiny barbells with their tongue or doing any kind of calisthenics with their sure. tongue. It seems like it could go really tired as you're going around doing that. Right. I, don't, I don't know what the intent is. Is it that you wear it all day long? I don't think so. I think you put it on like when it's time to brush your teeth and then do it. But I just, and then really? like, where do you keep it? I can I, see goth kids if it came in black. That's right. Wearing this yeah. to school. And, you know, oh. that can become the new, like, flipping someone off. You just stick that out right. and it says, hey. Or maybe, you know, the new version of a grill for the wrappers and have some diamond-encrusted tongue-to-teeth, you mm -hmm. know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. And uh, I wish them good luck because I love mm -hmm. Canada. I feel like an honorary Canadian. I'll be lecturing there uh, next week in Halifax. Look nice. forward to seeing some Canadian dentists out there. Bring and if there's some... any Canadian dentist <laughs> attending, yes who has one of these, please bring a tongue brush to me. Not your own, I'd like a new sealed one. Uh, I'd love to bring it home and try it out. Yeah, definitely, and bring you. me back some maple syrup, please. I absolutely will, okay. and a beaver tail, you know what that is? No. Oh, it's a good can. Poutine, you familiar with that? Uh, nope. Wow, you got a lot to learn Wait, about our neighbors no, hold on. the north. Is that the gravy stuff that they, no, no. Yes, you're, you're barking up the right tree. Okay. French fries fried... covered in gravy right. with cheese curds on it. See, I was close. That's why they're in such good shape. Uh-huh. All right. Anything else? Yes. In 2009, an Air France plane carrying 228 people crashed into the Atlantic Ocean, killing everyone on board. A recently disclosed report reveals that the pilot had only one hour of sleep. He can be heard on the plane's recording saying, quote, I didn't sleep enough last night. One hour. It's not enough. End quote. The pilot was taking a scheduled nap when the plane hit a storm. It reportedly took him more than a minute to respond to his co-pilot's call for help. Fatigue is a common problem in the aviation industry due to long and irregular shifts and short rest periods. Last year, a National Sleep Foundation survey of transportation workers found that one in five pilots said they'd made a serious error due to sleep deprivation. After another plane crashed in 2009, the Federal Aviation Administration introduced new regulations which will take effect next year. They will expand a pilot's minimum rest period between shifts and will require pilots to have at least 30 consecutive hours off once a week. And all pilots must also affirmatively state whether they are fit for duty before takeoff. Well, I'm sure they're going to say yes. I mean, I'm sure they're going to say, yeah, that's fine. But this right. is interesting because it brings up, you know, they don't mention sleep apnea in, sure. this, in this story at all. Um, and maybe he only got an hour of sleep. He didn't say why. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could have been any number of reasons. Definitely. Um, you get the feeling that had he been out partying, he, he might have bragged a little about that. Right. And he didn't, but it's difficult. They really haven't got a handle on why that, on why that plane crashed. But one of the things that um, the legislation here in the U.S. is that uh, truck drivers are now going to have to mm -hmm. be screened uh, for sleep apnea. Okay. Uh, because suffering from sleep apnea, obviously not getting good rest, mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, symptoms that you'll see is daytime sleepiness. And obviously when you're sitting in a car, that's an easy time to get kind of lulled sure. and just falling asleep. And it, it brings up a bigger point, and that is we're finally seeing snoring and sleep apnea uh, be looked at a little bit more from the dental field. These poor patients kind of slip through the cracks. Um, medicine 
kind of looks at it, but not really, and dentistry right. really hasn't either. And, and a great sign that we're heading in the right direction is that um, Dr. Gordon Christensen mm -hmm. uh, and I are making a DVD in May on snoring okay. and sleep apnea. It'll be the first one that Gordon's uh, ever made addressing this topic, and that shows you kind of how far it's come in the last, say, 10 or, or 15 years. So hopefully, um, the subject of sleep apnea will get, um, uh, you know, get more awareness in the press and hopefully pilots, you know, get tested for it as well because there's easy solutions. It's not like if you're a pilot and you have sleep apnea, you're going to get your license pulled. You're just going to need to wear, you know, an oral appliance or have a CPAP unit. And uh, so we'll end up with safer operators of different modes of transportation and, and better safety numbers for everybody. Definitely. And, I, and I, this story kind of hits close to home because I've seen my husband has sleep apnea. And it, while it is a sort of mild case, it has affected his life for years and he was made an appliance from our laboratory and it has just even in the first month of use um, it has dramatically improved um, his sleep he wakes up more rested he's nicer just a big plus um, and it's, it's just incredible to see what one little thing I mean it's not like you know now he can't do whatever he wants or there's jobs that he would be you know exempt from because he has it it's just at night he sleeps with an appliance and it totally has changed everything so I think that as long as we can keep getting the word out about it it will improve not only these like the pilots lives um, but also it can potentially save the lives of you know, the passengers on the plane or whoever's at the hands of the person with the sleep apnea. Exactly. So he's in a better mood now with it? He I haven't is, talked yes. to him since we delivered it. I've yes. just gone through you. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And it, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like he was some, you know, monster before, but you can just, you know, when you're tired, you have, you're sort of right. just grouchy right. and whatever. And I mean, I don't blame him. I'm, I'm not fun to be around when I'm tired or hungry. Right. Don't catch me hungry because then it's just going to be trouble. Well, but. it's probably safe to say, though, had he not been wearing that, and you fell on your mountain bike, he would have run you over before. And no. this time he didn't. This time he stopped and he said, hey, are you okay? Right. right, yeah. I don't know if we can attribute that to the to this sleep appliance, but whatever. That's okay. a stretch. Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear he's feeling better in addition to yes. he's not waking you up anymore during the mm -hmm. night. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time.